Hi, I'm Sugar from Sugar Coat It and today we're going to talk about how to take better food photos at home. So earlier this week I popped over to Brittany's house to record a bit of a collaboration in an Easter Bake Off. Now I may suck at baking but something I can do is take photos of baking. So while I was there we set up and I took some photos of her layered rainbow cheesecakes that she'd made for Easter and while I was there we talked about some of the tips that I use for food photography at home and so today I'm going to share those with you but before we jump into that let's check out a bit of the footage from the collab on Brittany's channel. Okay. Well, let's get stressed it says to do it fast. I know when I'm She's like, like freaking out. <laughs> I think I have to put butter in here now. Let me just check. Oh, into a bowl with the melted butter. Right. See, I wrote so down my I'm... ingredients and my recipes just using a phone. I was going to say I went old school and used the phone, but that's not really how old school works. <laughs> that's right. Let's start with gear. For me, I like to use a prime lens, so that used to be a 50mm. Uh, on my Fujifilm camera, I use a 35mm. Now, obviously, that's a cropped sensor, so it puts it back to that 50mm range. On my Nikon, I use the 50mm 1.4. Uh, I think it runs about $500 Australian, which would be cheaper pretty much anywhere in the world. But the thing is, you don't actually need the 1.4 if you can't afford to go to that price range. You can pay the $300 for the 1.8 and you'll have more than enough. The biggest thing is with food photography, you're never really going to need to bring your aperture down that low. Um, mostly because you just lose the detail and the context of what's happening with your food. So a simple prime lens at a 50 millimeter, you know, whatever you can afford is fine um, your iPhone with the depth of field portrait photography thing is also pretty cool uh, just whatever you have really but for me it's about those prime lenses or my plan in the future is to get more of a macro lens for either of my cameras and use that okay so the other thing I use a lot is um, core flute or chalkboard sheeting now this is just something that we picked up from the local hardware store they had off cuts and so I just picked up a couple of different sizes. I actually left the smaller of the boards, which was still, I don't know, board size, at Brittany's house because I had a larger piece of the white core flute anyway. This can be great for bouncing around lighting, it's great for backdrops, it's really easy to use and it's light. And with the core flute, it's easy to carry, move around, you know prop up against things if it's falling on top of stuff it's not a big deal because it's super light and easy to use so I love the core flute and I bought just a blackboard sheet so it's basically like an MDF really thin lightweight again board and it's got a blackboard surface on one side the biggest thing with food photography and any sort of product photography is that a lot of shine and gloss are just going to make your life so freaking difficult I was photographing a product for Air Week the other day and the whole freaking thing is like high gloss shiny black. So not only are the fingerprints a pain in the butt, but I basically can see myself in every single photo. It's like nightmare. So stick with matte surfaces. That goes for your anything that you're placing your food on, including plates, uh, surfaces, uh, dinnerware, like, no, what do they call it? Flatware, you know, forks, knives, spoons. Um, I like to use older items so that way you don't get as much shine as you do off new items. Now I know a lot of people think that newer is better, but with food photos it really isn't. Pick some items that have personality, if they've got a few nicks and chips and the shine's gone off them, that'll work better to create interest in your photo. As you can see here with Brittany's cheesecakes, we placed them on a really cute Easter themed cake stand. I just dumped around a few of the mini eggs that had been placed on top of the cake just onto her coffee table and then we, what else did we place around? We actually used a pillowcase and folded it up so it looked like a napkin and some bowls in a really pastely pink colour and then she had a really pale green pretty 
coloured bowl that we just threw all this together on her coffee table next to a window in her lounge room and with the core flute behind it we were good to go. One of the easiest ways to make your food photos look better is to just sit them somewhere with some, that was like a tongue twister, sit them somewhere with some great natural light. If you're taking these at home you may not have access to a bunch of lighting options. The internal lights in your house usually throw a weird like yellowy color and the whole thing just ends up looking really crappy really fast. So if possible get your like coffee table or some sort of table or set yourself up on the floor close to a window where you can really take advantage of the natural light that comes in that. Now if the window is frosted or you have a light uh, sheer curtain over it, even better. This will act as a bit of a diffuser and you can use that then to soften the light a little and just make your photos better. <laughs> Short version. The other thing that I like to do is make sure that I'm taking photos from a lot of different angles. Now I talked about this a little bit earlier, but you really want to, if you're shooting on a coffee table, you may as well get your butt on the floor. So that way you're shooting from a straight on angle, which is like a table level, and then you can shoot it up a little at 45 degrees and then you can shoot it overhead. Okay, let's quickly talk about depth of field. I talked about this quickly. A little bit when I was talking about the lenses and how you really don't want to go down to like a 1.4 aperture with food photography. I sometimes will hang out in the lower registers of my lens around that two and a half four sort of bracket but realistically if you want to capture the information of what's in this beautiful scene that you've set you're probably going to have to be more around eight like an 8 to 10 sort of aperture range. Have a bit of a play with it. Start to notice what comes into focus and what goes out. Most cameras will give you the opportunity to deal with your aperture. It'll be under A or if you're shooting on a point and shoot sort of camera, just look for the macro setting, which is like a little flower. I'll pop up the icon right here. Well, look for that because if you're taking food photos you definitely want the details that a macro can offer. Uh, from there we took pictures. <laughs> Let's jump on into Lightroom and what we're going to do now is a quick edit on some of these. Just move over to the develop settings. Okay so this is quite a cute shot as you can see with this, I tend to shoot underexposed so I don't lose a lot of the white highlights. So the first thing we're going to have to do here is brighten it up a little. Um, straight away, it starts looking pretty great. I think we lose a bit too much of the colors there. So we're going to drop down the shadows a little. What am I gonna do? Bring up the whites a little. I'm going to leave the blacks up just to give it that bit of like the washed out faded look about it. Um, I don't want clarity, vibrance or saturation. Um, you'll see here guys there's a difference between vibrance which we add, see how that goes, and saturation. So we might add about 15 points of vibrance just to really bump, maybe even just to try and bump the colors up. See how that's, it's a bit much clearly, but I wanna bring out the rainbow colors in this, but I don't wanna saturate the colors cause see how that makes it just a little much. I'm just gonna put them at about five. With food is the one place that I use vibrance. I just find that um, mostly for my stuff, it's quite understated and I under saturate a lot of my photos. So it's the one place that I really like to add a bit of vibrance and bump it out a little. I'm just going to quickly check the white balance just with the dropper because it looks a little cool. All I've really got to reference it to is this plate. Yeah, it was a little cool, but I don't, I also don't want it that warm. So I'm just going to drag that back down. That's a personal preference. With food, it is better to have it a little warmer. Uh, cold looking food images just usually aren't that enticing, to be honest. Okay, so we're just going to go with a bit of a basic tone curve here. I've got a few um, of the Visco presets and stuff like that loaded into my Lightroom, as well as just the standard 
hard, like medium contrast and strong contrast. You may want to go with something as simple as that medium contrast, which is, as you can see, quite a easy going line. It works. Okay, now I'm pretty happy with the colors. The only thing I'm not a huge fan of is how like dominant the yellow is. So not that I want to drag all the color out of it. I just want to desaturate it a little bit and just make sure that I'm happy with the tone of the color of it. I want it to be a, you know, a greeny yellow, not that pinky yellow. I'm squinting because I'm looking into the sun. I'm not going to do any split toning. We can deal with that another day. Now this is important for sharpening for food. So I want to add a little bit of sharpening, but when it comes to masking, you use the mask slider and hold down the option key and you'll be able to see then which areas we're dealing with. And I really just want to bring the detail into that main cupcake, like cheesecake center piece. But in this one, to do that, we're going to have to incorporate the two. Now this just deals with which sections are in focus, obviously, or sharpest. And we go from there and you can add more or less of that masking to sharpen more of the image or less. So I don't want to bring a lot of sharpness into that cupcake up there uh, because it's out of focus. So what am I trying to do? I really want to add the sharpness here to bring in the details without um, making it too like, like there's too much happening. Okay. And we're all good. We're going to go back to the top and just deal with if there's any cleaning up to be done. Now, as much as it's not a big deal, the cracks in the eggs drive, I find them a little distracting. So I'm going to use the healing brush, try and pick a size that pretty much just covers it. If I miss a bit, it's not a big deal because they're speckled. So we're just going to click on that, let it heal it. And sometimes if it just doesn't work, it doesn't work. So let's hit done. Okay, yeah, that worked. Because what I was going to do, if it hadn't landed correctly, I'd just come out, I like scrap it and start again. So let's, I'm just going to get rid of this one here. I generally tend to use just a single spot rather than a line like that. But because it is already a little out of focus, I'm not too worried either. Yeah, see, see what I mean? I don't really like that so it's more distracting now as it is so we're just going to reset that one oops I've reset them all which is super handy let's go back up here quickly she worked so as you can see sometimes I prefer to just go spot 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 because it's a little more efficient than that squiggly line uh, righto, we're just going to leave that alone before it becomes a whole thing. Um, and I feel like the shadows are a little dark here, so I'm just going to bump them up a little bit because what we're looking for is a fun, like festive image. So now that I've got that, you could either create a preset with these edits, but obviously we wouldn't have the single section edits, um, or you can just sync that all the way across using down here. Now normally I wouldn't bring the exposure across just because yeah I like to be able to deal with that myself. Synchronize and all of our pictures start to load through with that filter on them. So this one's going to need a crop because we've caught the background. It's going to need some more light not too far okay righto so that is editing these photos I'm just going to skip out of here okay thanks for being here that was how to edit your food photos at home even though the editing kind of got a little more detailed than I thought it would so if you have any questions please leave them in the comments if you're new here please consider subscribing uh, as far as I'm concerned we're here to up your social media game Okay, thanks guys. See you next time.